Hi and welcome to episode 13 of Understanding Dark Table. I thought in this episode we will start looking at masks. This is a pretty big topic, I don't think I'm going to get through it all in one video, I'm going to have to spread it out over a couple. As you can imagine, if you've used any other image editing application at any time in your life, masks allow us to restrict the effect of a given module to only certain areas of an image rather than affecting the entire image. And I thought that what I would do is use an image that's obviously got lots of colour in it and I'll use the monochrome module to demonstrate where masks are working and not working. So let's dive right on in here. Got a lovely image of Tegan, a model I've shot with many times before. I'll put a link to her uh, Instagram in the show notes. So we've got the monochrome module, we'll make that active and now we've got a monochrome image. And we'll see at the bottom of the module here, blend and a little drop down that says off. If we click on that, we've got uniform, drawn masks, parametric masks, drawn and parametric masks. So today we'll just cover uniformly and drawn masks. So uniform is very simple. We've just got an opacity slider that starts at 100%. So what that means is 100% of the effect of this module, the monochrome module, is being applied to our image. If we reduce that to say 79%, we've now got three quarters black and white, one quarter of the original color. If we go to 50%, we're at pretty much halfway between color and monochrome and as we move back towards zero we're back to our original color image. So that's a uniform mask. It's just a good way of dialing down the intensity of any particular module. So you might activate a module like what it's doing but just feel that the effect is a bit too strong you can simply use a uniform blend mode and a reduced opacity to dial back the severity of that particular module you've also got blend modes much like you have in Photoshop or GIMP and I'm going to confess to having never once in all of my time with Darktable used any of them with my masks uh, I probably should investigate that further, but up until this point, I've never had a need to. If you're familiar with how blend modes work in Photoshop or GIMP, then you probably already understand how they're going to apply to a mask as well. But let's move on to drawn masks. When we activate the drawn mask option, we get a whole bunch of new icons and parameters down here to play with. First of all, we're going to look at these five different shapes. We've got a brush, a circle, an ellipse, a path, and a gradient. I'll start with the gradient. When you select any of these five shapes, you'll see that they get highlighted by a little white square. That lets you know that you're about to apply that particular shape type as a mask to your image. So we left click once, and we've now got a gradient blend on this image and as we can see we've got color at the bottom and we've got monochrome at the top now when you look at the UI you'll see we've got this straight line across the middle with these couple of handles with a light gray dot and a dark gray dot and whenever we actually moused over any part of that UI we also get these two dotted lines appear those dotted lines represent 0% and 100% of the mask that this particular tool is applying and in the case of the gradient tool which is what we're currently working with this hard line across the middle represents 50% so where that line is we're at 50% between monochrome and color where the bottom row of dots is we're at 100% color and where the top row of dots is we're at 100% monochrome if we want to change the severity of that gradient, we simply use our mouse wheel. Dial it back towards you to reduce the severity of the gradient, to make it a softer, slower transition. Roll your mouse wheel away from you to bring those dotted lines in closer and to make the gradient more harsh, more severe, more rapid a transition. If you want to rotate 
the gradient tool, you can simply grab either of these two dots, the light gray dot or the dark gray dot, left click and drag, and it will always rotate around that center point, that 50% mark. If you want to move the whole gradient to a different part of the image, simply mouse over the middle line, left click and drag. So we can position our gradient wherever we want it. So if I wanted it right over Tegan, drop it there, rotate it so it was in line with her body, and now we've got a tool that is creating a gradient right across where Tegan appears in the image. Now, if we want to see this image without the tool being visible, we simply click this little icon here, near where it says one shape used, the one with the dots and the arrow. That's our edit tool. So we click that and now we're no longer editing that particular mask and we can actually see what the mask is doing to our image. If we want to reverse the effect of this particular mask, we can simply click the button beside it, the one that looks like a white circle with a black minus sign in the middle. That is a simple reverse of polarity of the mask. So where the mask, I'm just going to jump down here. See down here we've got this white square with a black dot in it. That shows us what the current mask looks like. So if we activate that, we can see that this is the mask that's being applied. So that's a 100% mask. We've got this transition area over Tegan's body, and then we've got this area over on the left-hand side of the image where there is no mask being applied. Now, just coming back to this toggle reversal switch, if we click that, we can see that the whole mask got inverted. So now the mask is being applied on the left side of the image and it's not being applied to the right side of the image. So we can just toggle plus or minus and you can see that from that icon, minus, plus. And now I will turn off the visibility of the mask. So that's the gradient mask. If I decide I no longer want a mask to be applied to an image, I can simply click on the edit tool to make all of the masks that are active in the image editable and right click anywhere on that mask and that removes that mask from the image. Okay, so let's look at the brush tool. We select our brush and we get this little white dot and what we can do is just left click and draw across our image. Now, what we end up with is a path that has all of these nodes along it and the number of nodes that get added to any brush stroke or path can be determined by an option in the setup under GUI options. Scroll down here to smoothing of brush strokes. Now by default it's set to medium. If you choose low, less nodes will be added, which will give you smoother curves, brush strokes, paths, whatever, but obviously with less ability to edit or finesse that brush stroke or path. If you choose high, you get more nodes added to that brush stroke or path, which means you can edit it more, but it will tend to be a little bit more jagged and less smooth. So it's up to you how many of those nodes you want added to a brush stroke or a path. You can use your shift modifier and your mouse wheel to change the fall off of the dotted line. It's essentially a feather command. So hold the shift key, roll your mouse wheel towards you whilst moused over the line and the little dotted line will get further away which increases the fall off between the actual mask and your original image. Shift key and mouse wheel away from you to make the feather more severe and tighter. So now that we've got our path drawn we can modify it simply by mousing over any one of these nodes and left click and we can drag it to change the shape of the path. And you will notice that when you click on any of these nodes you'll get this little handle that will appear coming out from it. And you can left click on that handle 
it's like a Bezier curve adjustment, which will allow you to change how that curve responds according to the other nodes either side of it. Similar to the shift key and mouse wheel combination to adjust the feather, you can use the control key and your mouse wheel to change the opacity of that brush stroke or path. So dialing your mouse wheel back towards you will set it to a 0% mask and hold the control key and roll your mouse wheel away from you will set it to a 100% mask or anywhere in between. If you want to get rid of that mask, again, we right click and that mask disappears. Okay, so let's look at the circle filter. Let's just click on Tegan's face and we've got our circle. So we can use our mouse wheel to make the filter smaller or larger. We can hold the shift key to control the hardness or the feather. So dialing the mouse wheel away from us makes that a much more severe transition between mask and no mask. Hold the shift key and dial our mouse wheel back towards us and we get a nice smooth transition. We can hold down the control key and use our mouse wheel to then change the opacity between 100%, bring our mouse wheel back towards us to get to 0% and anywhere in between and right click to remove. Okay, let's look at the ellipse. So we grab the ellipse tool, click on our image, and we've got this ellipse with four nodes around the ellipse, which allow us to change the length of each axis. So like so. And if you want to rotate the ellipse, you simply hold the control key when you mouse over any of these nodes, left click and drag to rotate the ellipse. So again, if I wanted the ellipse over Tegan's body, I could just do that and hold the control key, get a bit of rotation, and then I could change the size of that ellipse accordingly. Now, at the moment, the feather around our ellipse is in what is called proportional mode and that is not the default. The default is equal mode and to change between them you simply mouse over the control line for the path so that the dotted line is highlighted, hold your shift key and left click. Now your feather is in equal mode. So regardless of how much I warp this ellipse, the depth between this node and this part of the feather is the same for these endpoints as it is for these side points. So that height there is the same as that height or depth there. Shift and left click and we're back into proportional mode which means that the scale of the feather becomes proportional to the size of the ellipse. Okay, so now we can remove our ellipse and we will go to the path tool. Now the path tool is like the brush tool except you get to enclose a path. So left click once, left click twice, left click three times. If that was all I wanted, just a path made of three points, after I've clicked the third point, I right click and that closes the path. Right, so you click all of the points that you want and then right click. Does it matter where you right click? Let's find out. Let's go one, two, three. I want that shape. I'm going to go right up here and then right click. No, it has no effect where you right click. Just as soon as you right click, it assumes that all the left click points that you created prior to that were the limits of the path you wanted to create. As you can imagine, we've now got control points for those three points at which we clicked. And on the feather, we have control points as well. Now, 
with these control points, we can change the depth of the feather at that point of the path. So if I wanted to make this part of the feather quite severe, I can simply drag that node in towards the main part of the path. If I wanted to make this part of the feather uh, quite a soft transition, I can left click and drag that node away. And now this becomes a very soft feather, but this is a very hard feather over here on the left hand side. Again, I could just grab this top one, drag it in, that makes that a much harder transition around this portion of the path. But down here, we've got a nice soft transition. And if we get out of edit mode, we can now see that. So we've got this really hard transition up here. And down here, we've got a nice, smooth, soft transition. Go back into edit mode. And, and in fact, if we wanted to see that more clearly, we could just turn on the mask visibility. And there it is. So we've got this hard transition up here, soft transition down here. Go back into edit mode and let's get rid of that shape. Now, what if you want hard edges or corners to your path? Let's suppose we wanted to create a perfect triangle. We would click on our path tool and we would hold down our control key as we create each node. So control key, left click once, left click twice, left click three times, right click, and now we've got a perfect triangular shape, which we can still modify simply by dragging any of those three corners. We can change the shape of our triangle, but it'll always be a triangle. Again, we've got these nodes so that we can change the feather at any one of those corners. And if at some point you decided, you know what, I don't really need this to be a triangle. I wanted two hard corners, but I wanted the third corner to be, you know, a gradual curve. You can simply control click that corner. And now we've got this handle and that's become a curve. And with that handle, we can change the shape of that curve. Like I said, it's a typical Bezier curve. You're probably already familiar with the way those work from other image editing apps. And you'll also see that the node on the feather follows this handle. As I'm moving this handle around, you can see the node on the feather adjacent to it tracks with it. And again, we can drag our node in if we want to change the severity of that feather. And if at some point we decide, you know what, I really didn't want this to be a smooth curve, I did actually want it to be a sharp corner, we can simply control click it again. So control, left click, and it's back to being a sharp corner. You may find you have to do that a couple of times. I found that that was the case. Uh, it doesn't always convert straight back to a sharp corner on the first click, but a couple of clicks will usually do it. <laughs> All right. So I think that will do it for the various tools for creating drawn shapes. However, there are a couple of other things that we can look at. One is this invert mask option. By default, it's off. We can switch it to on. And that does much the same thing as this invert the polarity button up here. I think what happens is that when you start introducing multiple shapes to one image, these two things will then behave differently. The toggle polarity button will work on one shape at a time where the invert mask will work on all shapes that are active in the image. We then also have a mask blur. So as we've seen, we can change the fall off of the mask you know, by adjusting these nodes on the feather. But we can then alter the whole mask blur with this value down here, this slider. So that can soften the entire mask independently of any alterations you've made to the mask on a particular shape if that makes sense. Okay, 
So before I finish off, we will just have a quick look at the mask manager on the left hand side here. This collects every shape that you've made on this particular image. Even if you've deleted them, they still remain here. Now, if at some point I wanted to bring one of these back, let's say I wanted to bring back this circle shape, I can simply left click on it once and that shape is reintroduced to the image. But you'll notice that it's not active, right? The whole image is still monochrome. That's because down here where it says drawn mask on the right hand side in our monochrome module, it says no mask used. We drop this box down and we choose circle number six and now that shape has been made active again. Back in the mask manager, we can right click and select clean up unused shapes and that will get rid of all the shapes that we're no longer using. So that should leave us with just circle number six because that's the only one we've got active on this image at this point in time. And you'll notice that every shape is grouped under the module under which it was created. So in this case, all of my shapes were created under the monochrome module, so they all appear in this drop-down group monochrome. If you get to a point where you're using lots and lots of shape masks on a single image, then having them grouped under the module that they belong to will be quite handy. It will also mean that a shape you created for one module can then be used in other modules as well. So for example, I've created this circle shape which is currently being applied to Tegan's face. So her face is monochrome and the rest of the image is colour. If I was to then go to, let's say, tone curve, right, and I wanted to create a stupidly intense S curve, and apply that circular shape on her face to this tone curve module, what I could do is set this to drawn mask, then under drawn mask where it says no masks used, I could expand that and add this existing shape of circle number six and now this stupid S curve that I've created, which looks absolutely awful, is being applied to her face as well. So her face is now getting both the monochrome process and this tone curve process. So you can see that back in our mask manager, circle number six has now been applied to the monochrome module as well as to the tone curve module. So this is a good way to keep up to date with where you've used certain shapes. You can also rename these shapes. Simply left click and rename face, right? Which just helps for you know, keeping track of how you're using shapes and where you're using them in a given image. All right, I think that will do it for this particular video. I've been recording for much longer than I normally have, although I know I've got a lot of outtakes to cut out. Uh, but I suspect this is going to be one of my longest videos to date. Uh, in the next video, we will move on to parametric and the combination of drawn and parametric masks. So, talk to you then.